Thank you to Sam for telling that story. It's a great story, um, actually. And if you have a story about a day that has changed your life, please do let us know. Now, on Tuesday, Conservative MP Marc Francois urged the Prime Minister to toughen up the online harms bill, proposing it be renamed David's Law in memory of Sir David Amos uh, and include a ban on social media anonymity. The bill is currently under review before it's brought to Parliament later this year. It aims to reduce online abuse and misinformation by forcing big tech companies such as Facebook, Twitter and Google to abide by a duty of care overseen by Ofcom. However, many are concerned that legislation could lead to what they call state-sanctioned censorship. And there's also worries about who gets to define what is actually harmful online. And nevertheless, with a recent YouGov survey suggesting that 10,000 social media users in the UK read online abuse every minute, today we're asking, can we make social media safer? Here to discuss the issue are Imran Ahmed, Chief Executive for the Centre of Countering Digital Hate, and lawyer and director of Foxglove, Corey Kreider. Also joining us are Sasha Havlicek, co-founder and CEO of the Institute of Strategic Dialogue and director of Open Rights Group, Jim Killock. Uh, welcome to you all. Uh, so, Sasha, uh, we spoke about the tragic killing of Sir David Amos last week. Uh, before he died, he raised concerns uh, about threats and abuse directed towards MPs online. Now, that has uh, led to calls to remove anonymity from social media. That, that's a good thing, isn't it? We've got to be very careful that whatever measures we put in place, whatever regulation we have, um, supports human rights. We've got to make sure we don't go the authoritarian route. Um, but there are major problems that we do need to see regulated. And um, we've certainly seen through the research that we do, online monitoring of a whole range of online harms from COVID and anti-vax disinformation uh, to abuse and harassment of public figures, to targeted hate and even mm. violent extremist propagandizing. We've yeah. got two sets of problems. But, but, but what about and... the, what? Sorry, Sasha. Just to cut you, what about this issue of anonymity? Is that, is well, that the right way to go? The, the people can hide. Basically, the they can say horrible things and they can hide. Well, this is the thing. We we've got other ways in which to deal with this. The problem, the problem is that anonymity, if we cut the ability for people to post anonymously around the world, we stop the ability of advocates of freedom, advocates of democracy in places uh, which face terrible uh, persecution by governments to have the ability to mobilize. And that civic activism, of course, is something that this country, that democratic countries want to support. We've got other ways in which to do this and to do this right. And I think that the duty of care um, is a really, really good step in, in that direction. Mm. And it has to deal with not only the problem of content, bad content that has proliferated badly because the companies are not enforcing properly their own rules on these platforms. And we've seen that awful flourishing of everything from hate to conspiracy. But it's also the fact that, worse still, these companies are, their recommendations systems are inorganically amplifying harmful and extreme misleading content. So what we're actually seeing is that their own systems are amplifying and then targeting at some of the most vulnerable users online, um, the, the kind of content that leads to terrible harm. And it's that problem, that amplification problem, that we need to see this regulation really address, not just the problem of content itself. Uh, yeah, yeah. I uh, thank you so much, Sasha. Very comprehensive there. But um, let's let me bring this to Jim, because according to the YouGov survey, over 10.6 million um, people have received online abuse over the last 12 months. Okay, so that's more than one in 10. This is, you know, very, very serious. Um, so a proposed online harms bill um, is currently being discussed, as we know. But how? Does it hope to change this? And does it even have legs? I mean, I think the bill's a really, really flawed thing. Um, it, it's trying to address both legal content, which is deemed harmful, and illegal content. And when it talks about legal but harmful, that's the kind of a, a, a routine abuse that you're kind of talking about. Uh, these, these things may not reach a, a threshold of legality. Sometimes they will. Um, but the the 
what the bill tries to do is to say, well, now a minister is going to decide, literally a minister, what is uh, harmful or not. So it's not based on evidence. It's mm -hmm. a, a minister saying this is harmful. We had Pretty Patel only a few weeks ago saying that we should ban boat uh, pictures of small boats coming across the channel because that was encouraging harmful behavior. So Pretty Patel gets the power to say to social media that small boats crossing the uh, channel is harm online and should therefore be banned now, you know that's a, that's a really extreme situation but that's what we mm. get with this bill yeah. so i don't think this is a, a good approach you take it a little bit back to why you know we were talking about the recommendation engines and so on that's about your personal data and about the business model and the business model comes from a lack of choice people feel obliged to use facebook and twitter and the recommendations also come from the uh the, your personal data and how your personal data is used. The government mm. wants to get rid of the restrictions on the way that your personal data is used, which mm. will amplify all of these problems. That's literally what they're proposing in yeah. the GDPR do, do, proposal. Can I just right say now. something, so Jim? I, I think the government is basically utterly incoherent here. Yeah. This isn't a good thing because it can only drive at the edges. You know, you were talking about the most extreme content. If you try to do anything else, all the free expression harms just get worse and worse and worse. So the companies and the regulators will only focus on the absolute worst things. We need to change the market here. But we you know what? At least, at, least, at least something is being done. It's better that something's being done than nothing's being done. No, really no. I mean, doing what? something bad is, is worse. Yeah, so, so Corey, given all of that, is it is fair enough that we leave it to the social media companies to, to deal with all of this, not government? I think we've had 15 plus years of unregulated social media and it has failed. But I would agree with Jim that actually the law has got some real problems and, and dealing with the front end of content is going to lead to a really complex and messy game of whack-a-mole essentially. But there's a whole bunch of other stuff that isn't in this bill that actually government could do because lots of people are asking ourselves, what do we do about the problem of global social media? One of the things I would say is that size matters, right? How have we got to a situation where a handful of executives in Silicon Valley have decided what should be prioritized for absolutely a third of the entire planet? And they've done it and they've designed the system according to what will make them rich. That's what will keep your eye on, what will keep you clicking, what will keep you liking, what will keep you sharing. And they surveil you, your kid, your partner, uh, to figure out what kind of category. So your teen girl is really interested in weight loss content. So she's just going to be served that again and again and again because it keeps her online. So to go back to what you do about it, yes, you can try and designate all kinds of series of contents and say, take it down, take it down, take it down. But actually, maybe a platform that is too big to moderate safely is too big to exist at its current size. So that's one thing. The other thing I would say, I would agree with them about the algorithms. So how do they keep you hooked in? How do they keep you clicking on those ads? As I say, they've built a super specific profile of you. They, know, they don't just know what you do on Facebook. They know what you've done on the web. They know where you're going. I mean, you know, Google, if you've got a Fitbit, has got your pulse and your health data. But, you know, these, these companies have got an extraordinary amount of information about you. And at the moment, this bill just takes things like advertising, which is the whole business model of the internet. It's the whole profit incentive that we're talking about here and just takes it off the table. The idea that you're gonna be able to make any progress without dealing with that, I think is silly. Uh, I do think that there is a need to give some regulatory body somewhere greater audit powers to kind of look up the hood, look at, lift up the hood and kind of look and see, like, how are these algorithms working? Yeah. How do we decide what gets fed to people? <clears throat> um, but at the moment, there's not enough of that for Ofcom. So, I think I would definitely say absolutely regulators need to get to grips with it. Uh, but but yeah. this is this is an odd approach to it. Okay, yeah. The last thing I'll say okay, is that this isn't just an algorithm problem, yeah, it's a okay. human problem. Let me these just are, bring in Imran here. These people having to moderate this content. Yeah. And actually there's okay, nothing that's said about that system either. Thank you, Corey. Let me just bring in Imran because your research has found that these companies are not that successful in taking down, you know, um, comments. You know, how can they do better? Well, what we've seen is a series of failures by the company. Look, there's there's three tests they were set really over the last year. One was, can they deal with the proliferation of racism, in particular targeted towards footballers, which has a normalization effect. It has a broader social effect in society. The second was, can they deal with anti-vaccine misinformation, the kind that has led to higher vaccine hesitancy for the COVID vaccine than we've ever seen before? 
And look, if it's sustained, it could be catastrophic for our societies. We are incredibly reliant on vaccination as a means of staving off disease, death, disability. And the third test was, can they deal with the sort of election misinformation that led to the riots at the Capitol? But that, you know, we've seen as well through the recent revelations have caused problems throughout the world, including in the United Kingdom. And we've seen misinformation, digital misinformation, cause real harm in the UK. So how have they done, how have they done across those three tests? They really brutally failed. Mm. And at this point, especially given that they've serially refused to accept any of the independent research done by organizations such as the Center for Countering Digital Hate, it's time for two things. First of all, transparency. We need to be able to see what happens in these companies, the algorithms, the enforcement, why it is that they don't take things down, their economics and the advertising market, which 98% of the revenues of social media companies come from advertising, and to what extent they bend the content to suit the needs of advertisers when it comes to privacy, when it comes to data. The second thing is we need accountability. Yeah. These executives have gotten away with essentially denying, deflecting, and delaying any action. They failed, and they've caused enormous harm to our societies. That requires both economic restitution, but at some point, criminal charges yeah. too. Okay, uh, I mean, it's, we we need to put the other side to this. All social media companies uh, claim that they're doing uh, their utmost to um, avoid harmful messages. So, uh, for example, Facebook say uh, we've invested nine point five billion pounds on safety and security since twenty sixteen, and have more than forty thousand people working in this area. We have almost halved the amount of hate speech uh, people see on Facebook over the last three quarters, down to zero point zero five percent of content views. Uh, or around five views per every 10,000. Uh, and of the hate speech we removed, we found 97% before anyone reported it. Uh, that's up from 23% uh, a few years ago. I mean, that's, that's, uh, I mean, you're shaking your head, Imran. I'm afraid we haven't actually got uh, much yeah. time uh, to deal with, <laughs> to get your response. But it's, it's because, the, well, they're it's not here to defend themselves, so it's good that we can hear um, another side. But, Sasha, can I just ask you, I mean, ultimately, the internet can be... Um, a force of good because we all use it um, so whether it's for bringing people together um, you know promoting an event promoting products um, so you know what gives you hope that we can make the internet a better place number one that we are moving towards regulation that's going to get us under the bonnet in terms of that data to evidence how these algorithms are impacting harm. This is not a free speech environment. We've got to get away from that um, uh, understanding of it. This is a curated speech mm. environment. And we need to make sure that we've got the transparency to understand the impact of these algorithms on our society, on these harms. Yeah. Once we see that, once there is that transparency, we can put in place the measures really required. But okay. as Imran said, and as ISD's research has showed, the companies have repeatedly failed, not only in terms of removing the content that they say they want removed, they are failing on that front, but they are also feeding us okay, inorganically Sasha. harmful oh. content at scale. Uh, we, we are out of time. I mean, maybe we can continue this on Twitter or Facebook, but uh, yeah. we, we can't do it on telly because we're out of time. So it's really good to talk to you all. Thank you very much indeed.